Welcome to the Word Podcast. The Lord God has given us His Word. Let us learn it. Let us live it. Let us rejoice in it. Spread the Word. Blessings, everybody. This is Dale. Thank you for joining with me again on the Word Podcast. We continue our examination, uh, just more of a seasonal type of sidetracking here, uh, related to giving of thanks. You know, the Scripture tells us so much about giving thanks to the Lord, and we actually see patterns. Uh, we see some processes. We see some procedures. We see how we're to give thanks. And we've examined some of these things in various portions of Scripture. I want to go to one today that is uh, is somewhat buried, though it's quite an extended passage. It'll probably take us several episodes to get through this. And you know how that goes. I thought we'd spend three or four episodes talking about Thanksgiving. And I don't know, we'll probably wind up spending seven to ten. And then we'll pick up the one another thing that we were looking at, okay? But this is out of First Chronicles chapter 16. Yes, First Chronicles, the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. Uh, First Chronicles 16, verse 1 says this, And they brought in the ark of God and placed it inside the tent, which David had pitched for it. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. Now you think, well, that's a simple verse right there. It is a simple verse, but boy, there is so much in that verse that shows us so much. And particularly if you've gone back and if you've uh, read and uh, remembered or if you've learned what all was happening. And um, I haven't gone back and reviewed it, okay, for this time together. I'm just doing this off the top of my head. But um, what had occurred right here, the ark of God had been captured. Remember, the Philistines had captured it, and they kept it several uh, years, and it was lost, quote-unquote, lost in, in different places for several years. It wasn't where it was supposed to have been, which would have been in the tabernacle of Moses. Okay, That's where it was, and that's where it should have been. Well, they finally retrieve it, and they do it in the way that God tells them to. At first, they didn't do it the way God tells them to, and it cost somebody their life. <coughs> but David finally gets to ark back. But then it says here in this verse right here that he placed it inside the tent which David had pitched for it. And you find out that there is a tabernacle of David and the tabernacle of Moses that were functioning at the same time. The tabernacle of Moses was continuing to go on with the sacrificial system and all the stuff that God had told him to do, but the Ark of God wasn't there. The Ark of the Covenant was not there. David had taken it and put it in a tent that he pitched for it. And here you find out that he's offering burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And we're about to read some more verses here. You're going to see that people are coming and going before this thing, and they're worshiping before it. Now, if you know anything about the Ark of the Covenant, you know that there's only one person that could go before it, the high priest, and he only did that on one day of the year, and it was quite a procedure and a process to do that. And he went before it to uh, offer blood in, for the sins of the people. But here you see something totally different. You think, how in the world? What is going on here? How can this be? Why did God not strike David dead? Why did God not strike the people dead when they were worshiping in this way? So uh, we're not told point blank why God doesn't, but there's a couple of things that I think we can infer from what we see within the balance of the Scripture. Uh, for instance, with the sacrificial system, the Levitical law, the Mosaic law, you see all these sacrifices that were uh, to be offered for sin. But when you look closely, you find out that there was no sacrifice. There was no atonement, an offering of something that would atone in place of and, and, and defer the punishment of. There was nothing provided for intentional sin. Intentional sin. This was all sin that someone did, and it was quote-unquote accidental, unintended, but not intentional. There was no sacrifice for that. And when you realize that, you think, well, how in the world, why didn't God just strike them all dead? Because everybody will commit an intentional sin. And I think it's just a vivid picture of God's grace and of God's mercy that he didn't do that. So why did God not strike them dead? And why is it that David pitched another tent? Well, I think the Lord led him to do it. We don't have an account of that, but we know that David was after the heart of God. He was a man after the heart of God. Was he perfect? No. Did he commit intentional sin? Go ask Bathsheba. You know, of course he did. And yet God allowed him because his heart was after him to pitch this tent to bring the ark of God into it. Then verse 2 says this. First Chronicles 16, when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blesses the, blessed the people 
in the name of the Lord. He distributed to every one of Israel, both man and woman, to everyone a loaf of bread and a portion of meat and a raisin cake. So they had a little bread appetizer, a little meat, a little steak, and a little dessert. Then, verse 4, he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord. So they ministered before the ark of the Lord. And I'm taking that to mean that it's not outside the tent or anything, that they are in the tent before the ark of the Lord, even to celebrate and to thank and praise the Lord God of Israel. So David appointed these Levites to be ministers and to worship, to celebrate, and to give thanks and to praise the Lord God of Israel before the presence of the Lord God of Israel. Verse 5 tells us, and 5 and 6 tells us who these guys were, Asaph the chief, and second to him Zechariah, then Jeel, then Shimeroth, then Jehiel, then Mattathiah, Eliab, Benaniah, Obed-Edom, and Jeel with musical instruments, harps, lyres. And also Asaph, who was the chief, played loud sounding cymbals. The chief, the drummer was the chief. That's what it says here. Then verse six, and Benaniah and Jehaziel, the priest blew trumpets continually before the ark of the covenant of God. So what you see is that David established this Levitical type of thing of praise and of worship and to minister before the Lord in celebrating and giving of thanks and praising him. And I tell you, I think this is something that we need to do more of. We need to have less services like we have in churches, and we need to have more times of giving of thanks and of praise and of prayer and of celebrating and to do it with musical instruments, harps and lyres and loud cymbals. Right now, most of what passes as worship in churches are things that are done to reach a particular thing. I'll give you an example from my life, which I've shared before, but I think I'm not sure if I have in this format or not. But I remember years and years and years ago, uh, I was a, um, I grew up uh, playing piano, playing organ and piano in churches and accompanist type of thing. And I'm off at college, and um, a friend of mine led uh, the music at a local church, and he was a choir director. That's what you were then, choir directors. And he's going to be out of town. He said, hey, can you come in and, and do this uh, for me? I'm going to be out of town. I thought, well, you know, I could do that. I was like 20 or 21 years old. You know, I could do that. So I went to that church. I've uh, never been there before in my life. Went there on a Wednesday night and practiced with their choir. And we were going to sing three hymns, three, four hymns. Uh, the choir was going to sing a song. I was going to play the offertory and do my best Dino impersonation. You know, how many notes can I hit in three minutes, 22 seconds? Had that all laid out. We go in there Sunday morning. Well, they had a, an interim uh, preacher, and this guy was old. And so he was like in his 80s, and this was back in the 1970s. So that means this dude was born like in the 1890s, seriously. And so we sang a couple of songs, and then he got up and said, that's enough of these preliminaries. Let's get on with the preaching. Well, see, in his mindset, all this stuff that we were doing was just preliminary for the preaching. And there's still tremendous echoes of that that are left over in, in the body of Christ, that these are all just preliminaries for something, whether it be the preaching or whether it be the offering or whether it be this. And we totally missed the point that, no, we are called to worship the Lord. We're called to give thanks. We're called to celebrate him. We're called to praise him in spirit and in truth. And I think we need to be doing more of this day in and day out, not just at particular times on a Sunday or a Wednesday evening or whatever it may be, but we need to be giving thanks constantly, and we need to be giving thanks constantly corporately in worship. Now, one more verse, and then we'll pick it up next time. Verse 7 says this, Then on that day David first assigned Asaph and his relatives to give thanks to the Lord. And you're going to wind up sort of following this all the way through Scripture. But he assigned them. This was their role. This was their functioning. This was their calling to give thanks to the Lord. Next time we're together, we'll start exploring what they said because there's several, I forgot, maybe 20 verses here of this proclamation of how they gave thanks to the Lord. In the meantime, I'm Dale. I'll see you then. Goodbye.